So we're getting prepared now for D-Day. And we're going to see some uh, films here of uh, how many different uh, pieces of supply we needed. It, you, it's huge, it's gigantic, and you'll get an idea of how long it took to get all those supplies. And, and uh, okay. Yeah, here are some of the uh, troops. Yeah, I, and I don't, you know, I'm just guessing. Uh, I don't know whether they're going down to, the, to practice or whether they're really going down to board the ships that will go across the channel. Okay, next. Yeah, here are some of the big pieces of equipment that had eventually had to be carried over, not initially, not the first day, maybe the third day, the fourth day, or thereabouts. Next one. Okay, now just look at, look at that, the, the number of troops and, and vehicles. Okay, next. Yeah, here, just look, rows of tanks. Let's just give you an idea of, of how many supplies were needed to, to make this invasion. By the way, it's the largest uh, uh, amphibious invasion ever in the world. This is the largest one ever. Okay. Ambulances. Next. Yeah. These are uh, anti-tank guns. Look at the. Okay. And there are you uh, ones that we have there, the uh, 75 millimeter uh, cannons. Next. Okay. Here's a tank that's going to board one of these uh, ships. Now this, they, these ships here wouldn't land until long after D-Day. And here's the chaplain probably uh, uh, wishing them well because they were just ready to go on the uh, boats to uh, Normandy. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little uh, story today too about uh, another chaplain who uh, was very brave and he, and he did something that very nice for the American troops. Okay. Uh, just a little reminder about yesterday. <clears throat> Remember, um, Patton was up in this uh, part of, of England here. I think it's called Anglia. And, uh, and this is the closest that, uh, land to up in that uh, pas de Calais. It's about 21 miles. And I'd say from uh, Portsmouth up there uh, all the way to here would be about 40 miles. Now, uh, you know, this is the Cherbourg Peninsula right here. So the channel is always choppy. It's always cold and it's always choppy. So uh, this little barrier here was nice because it, 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 uh, the, the water in here is a little calmer than it is up here, see? So that was better for our troops that were going to land on uh, Normandy. All right. Now, there's General Eisenhower speaking to the uh, troops just before D-Day. And, you know, as he's speaking to them, I'm sure he's saying to himself, half these men will be dead tomorrow as he's talking to them. But he was trying to uh, encourage them. Okay. All right, now this shows you the landings here. See? The Americans landed at Utah and at Omaha. And the, the Brits, uh, they are two here. Well, probably one was Australian, maybe the other one, oh, here's Canada. One was probably Australian, and maybe this is the Britain. And this is, uh, you know what, we don't see on this map, and, and it should be located, I'd say, right about here, the town of Khan. See, and, and, and I don't see that on there. But anyway, it is located right here because Montgomery landed in here with his British troops and he was supposed to take Khan on the first day or the, the uh, uh, December, um, June 6th. So uh, uh, when they landed here uh, on D-Day, we, we show, let's show some of that. Of course, the planes came and, 
And fortunately, we had air superiority. If we didn't have air superiority, I don't think the invasion could have been possible. So you must have air superiority. And we did have it because we were sending so many planes over uh, uh, to England. We had so, you know, as a Ford was making uh, airplanes and, and uh, General Motors was making tanks and, and uh, we had so many defense planes and we, we were called the arsenal of democracy because we were making all these different supplies that we needed for the war. All right, here's a, here's a typical, this is a Higgins boat. This is a good shot of it too. You can see how crowded it is too. They try to get as many men as possible. And then you can't see the, the front up there, up on top. It's too bad yeah. that. And uh, okay. that's the, it comes down. Now, I, this, this, is, this is my personal opinion. This is not, you don't see this in books. My personal opinion is this, see? These Higgins boats were piloted by Navy men. They were, you know, they're the ship, they're, they're, they're the ship people. So they had Navy men piloting these things. I think that was a big mistake. I'll tell you why. Uh, you see, if you, if you were a Navy man and you were on one of these Higgins boats, when you're leaving uh, England, you're 40 miles away from the war. And you keep going closer, now you're 20 miles away. Maybe you're 10 miles away. Now when you're 10 miles away, you start to get artillery that might hit you. So then you keep going closer, you're five miles away, now maybe mortars can hit you. Now you're one mile away, and you're one mile away, and uh, uh, mortars could get you, and uh, maybe even some high-powered uh, rifles. Now the closer you get, the more hazardous it becomes. See, and I, I see, and instead of a Navy man, I would have had, see, there had to be a lieutenant on here or a captain. I would put that lieutenant or the captain in charge of that Higgins boat because he's going to fight with those men and he's going to get them as close to the beach as he can because they show, show some more. And I'll show you how, see, now you see, if, if you got off here, look how, Look how deep it is. Look how long it would take you to get from here to the shore. And you know, the Germans are up there. They're in their uh, uh, bunkers and they're firing machine guns. Some of the men never even got off the, uh, the Higgins boat. They were killed right in the, as soon as the flak came down, the, the machine guns would mow them down. So, uh, see, the closer you get, the, the better chance they had. Now, these, the guys landing here, had very little chance for survival. Yes. Okay. All right. Next. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Again, you see how far away from land they are. That they would be mowed down. Okay. Next. Now here, see. Now this is great. See, if you were on this boat here, you take a couple of steps and you're on the sand. And and you know you can uh, if they're firing machine guns at you, you could hit the ground and fire back yourself from a very low position. But if you're way out there, you can't do that. There's a, once you get off the uh, Higgins boat, that's the way the boat should be, very close to shore. See again here, look how far away they are. Now they're, they're so a machine gunner up there could probably kill one machine gunner could probably kill all of them. And they're just helping the men get, once they hit the beach, then they'd help them because they were exhausted and sometimes wounded. We showed you where they landed on the five beaches. Next. Now it says here, oh, it says here, uh, it cost the lives of 250,000 men this Normandy uh, landing. And, uh, okay, next. You know, there were the five landings. Where, where the Americans landed on Omaha Beach, there were high bluffs there. It was a very difficult place to land. See, but once, you, once you were in a war, if you are have the, if you're high, you're looking down, you have a tremendous advantage. If you're down below and you're looking up, 
you're at a disadvantage because you can see so very little. But when you're up, you can see the troops, where they are, what kind of support they have, what, what direction they're going in, and uh, it's a big advantage. So it was a big disadvantage for us on Omaha Beach, and that's where we suffered the, the heaviest casualties. Thank you. Okay. Mulberries. Oh, yes. Okay. Now, uh, what we needed there, we needed a port. Now, uh, when the Americans landed on Utah Beach, they landed on that little uh, Sherberg uh, Peninsula. They, they didn't do too well, the landings they had a lot of trouble, but then they were hoping that they could, and they did. They cut across the peninsula, and they trapped all the Germans that were up in here, and then they moved up because this was a big port. Sherbur was a big, and boy, if we had that port, we would have saved a lot of lives. But, but when, by the time the American troops got up to Sherburg, to the port, it was gone. It was demolished by the Germans. They, there was nothing left of it, so they, and they couldn't, even, they couldn't even repair it. That's how much damage that was done because uh, not only did they blast it, but then all that debris was there that have to remove all that debris. It would take months to do that. So they never really made good use of uh, Sherburg. All right? And uh, again, we don't see... Con okay, next one. No, you're talking the mulberries. Oh, mulberries. the mulberries. Oh, yes, okay. So since we didn't have any ports here, what they did... They tried to create a port, and they created a port in this manner. They got huge pieces of cement, and uh, uh, let me draw it. Okay, the mulberries look like this. It was a huge piece of cement. It was empty on the inside. It was hollow. So when they put it in the water, it floated, and they floated it across the English Channel, at, you know, about the, about the second day or maybe the third day, and then and then they had uh, some some uh, dynamite in here. They exploded the dynamite, and the water rushed in, and the uh, sank. it sank, and it sank, and it created a port. It was the beginning of creating a port because then uh, other ships could uh, land alongside. Troops could uh, be landed on here and then go to shore, walking to shore instead of going through the water. So these mulberries were very helpful. And um, up until it got very stormy, uh, about three days after they landed, and some of them were destroyed by the turbulent weather. It was too bad because they were very helpful. Okay, here, Here's a book here, and it says, 24 hours that saved the world. Because this could be very true. Could you imagine if, just imagine this, if this invasion had failed, you saw all the supplies for years and years that we've been, the Americans have been sending supplies to England preparing for this day. So uh, if they made that attempted landing and it failed, all those men would have been killed, all those ships would have been destroyed, and if we wanted to... Uh, make a second invasion, it would take years, really, to build up enough supplies, enough boats, and enough men, and, and, and everything else. So, now here's what happened. Let's, let's say that did happen. Let's say that did happen. And uh, the invasion failed, all right? So the first thing the Germans would know is that they didn't have to worry about an invasion anymore. So now they could send all the troops all the tanks that they had in France and sent them to Russia and attack really one way. They just have one side to attack. And, and if they had defeated Russia, let's think about it. If they had defeated Russia, so now they defeated Russia and, uh, and there's no way that we're going to invade. So uh, how are we going to defeat the Germans? Now, here's the thing, too. Remember, the Germans are building the atomic bomb. See? So, you know, if that invasion failed, you know, well, let me tell you about Ladice now. Ladice is a little town in Czechoslovakia. And remember, 
Uh, I showed you the other day that Hitler said he wanted the Sudetenland, and he took the Sudetenland, and then shortly after that, he took over all of Czechoslovakia. Well, a, a, a German uh, commander by the name of Heydrich, I think he was a general, he was in command of that part of Czechoslovakia, and he was in the town of Ladice. And uh, what he did, every Sunday, he would have a public hanging, and he'd invite the public to watch, and he'd hang the Czechs that were, oh were, were living in the town of Ladice. They didn't do anything wrong, they just lived there. And he just wanted to, he imprisoned a lot of them. And, uh, and then he'd have a hanging every Sunday. He'd, have, he'd hang 10 men. So you know, can imagine now, just imagine that. Uh, if the Germans had been successful there and they invaded the United States, can you imagine the American people living under conditions like that where someone will come along and say, well, let's hang the, let's hang the, let's hang the, all the people in the first two rows here. And there's nothing they can do about it. You couldn't go to court, you couldn't say anything. They just said, this will be done, and that's it. There was no, uh, there was no jury, there was no democracy, there was, there was no right or wrong. It was just the Nazi way, and, and if the Nazi says this, that's the way it was going to be. So that's the way we would have been living in America, the way the people lived in the dice. So the Czechs were so angry, the Czechs that were free, some of the Czechs escaped, and they were in, f probably fighting with the British. So they were so angry that they got two Czechs in a plane, they flew them over Czechoslovakia and parachuted them into Czechoslovakia. And then once they landed in Czechoslovakia, they went into the town of Ladice and they looked for Hedrick. And Hedrick was coming by in his car one day and they got their machine guns and they blasted him while he was in his car and they wounded him. He didn't kill him, they wounded him. He went to the hospital and while he was in the hospital, he died. He died from the wounds. Well, Hitler and Himmler were angered by this. So what did they do? They went to the town of Ladice and they killed everyone in the entire town. They killed everyone in Ladice. Uh, again, look, look, just think about Hitler and Nazism in the United States. And they'd say, well, let's kill everybody in Logan. Just like that. And everyone would be killed in Logan. And no say so, just nothing at all, just the Nazi word. So we're, we're very lucky that, uh, that the invasion was a success because they, we landed successfully on the beaches and then we started to move up, uh, up and move the Germans back off the beaches and we were into now the hedgerows. This is part of a hedgerow. See, this is a very tall hedgerow, see from four feet, it's about four feet, eight inches high up there. Uh, maybe, maybe this is about six feet tall, maybe seven feet tall. And that's a, that's a very tall hedgerows. Uh, some of the other hedgerows were smaller. Adana? Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And this is what the hedgerows look like. And I'll tell you why there are hedgerows there. The farmers built, the Germans didn't build them, the farmers built these hedgerows and the years before the war, many, many, 100 years before the war, maybe more. And uh, they built these hedgerows because when it rained, instead of the rain flowing away from the plants and the trees that they had here, the, the water was, was contained in these high walls. So they saved the water for their plants. And that's, how, that's why they built the hedgerows. And that's why some of the hedgerows were from here to here. They were about, I, I, I used to play football and I, I, I knew what 100 yards looked like. So they were about 100 yards, some of them. Some of them were 85 yards. Sometimes there were 60 or 50 feet of cross, sometimes, four, you know, they varied because the farmers were building them and they didn't have any uh, specs that they had to uh, abide by. So these were the hedgerows and we were in there. Now, be, the beach was bad, really bad, because we suffered so many casualties. The hedgerows were almost as bad as the beach, really, because I'll tell you what we did every day. 
every day we were behind the hedge behind the hedgerows, and then uh, someone would come along and say the two dreaded words, jumping off. When we heard those two words, something would happen in our stomach. We, we, get, we were scared. We were absolutely frightened when we heard the two words because jumping off meant that we'd have to climb over the, uh, this hedgerow here and then run down this field here, firing up whatever guns, rifles, pistols, carbines, and we'd run down all the way down here. In the meantime, this is the thing too, I could never, well, it was hard to understand, is that every morning we would, here's what would happen, at a, about uh, a quarter to nine, we would uh, send artillery shells and bomb the Germans. To me, it, to me, it seemed like they were waking up the Germans a quarter to nine because they knew we were gonna attack at nine o'clock. They, so they bombed and then at nine o'clock, sure enough, we would jump over the hedgerows and race down this field and try to get as fast as we can all the way to this hedgerow because we could hide behind this hedgerow once we got there. See, once we were out in the open like this, they were shooting uh, rifles and machine guns and mortars and artillery and we kept running and as we ran, sometimes you'd, you'd, you'd see a fellow right next to you just fall to the ground. And uh, if they said, I'm hit, it, w it wasn't bad. If they said, I'm hit, they were pretty lucky. But if they said nothing and just groaned, then we knew it was, it was over. And so we would just run down here until we got here. And as soon as we got here, we would immediately dig foxholes. Okay, show another one. Yeah, see, see, see now some of the hedgerows were very tall like this, and some, some roads were narrow like this. By the way, I want you to keep this, this road in mind, because later on, after Falace, I'm going to tell you what happened on one of these roads. So just pick, keep this picture in mind. Okay, next. All right, here we are running across the field to, uh, to another hedgerow, and we ran as fast as we could. Next. Yeah, here's, a, here's a, uh, one of our GIs holding an M1. He's taking a little rest. He probably just got, got there, and the hedgerow's on the other side, and he, so he's getting a little breather. And in fact, look, so I think he's, he's already dug his foxhole in here. So he's, he's, uh, he'll be in that foxhole uh, all afternoon and probably sleep in there all night. Next. And then this is show you some, an, another road here. Now this road is a little wider. See, some roads were wide, some were narrow, uh, some you can ha just barely walk through, but here you just see some uh, dead soldiers in the road. And oh, this is what happened too. When we were racing from one hedgerow to the next hedgerow, uh, some men would get wounded and some men would get killed. Well, right after we, uh, took that hedgerow, went to the next hedgerow, the medics would come along and treat the men who were wounded. And they, they'd give them treatment uh, right on the field, and then they were, if they were badly wounded, they'd send them back to the hospital. And uh, the men that, uh, who were killed, they'd stay there until the grave detail, and there's a grave detail that came along that took all the dead soldiers. And they usually put them on trucks, and then, and then later on they would... Uh, attempt to bury them somewhere. So every, every, uh, every morning uh, we would be, present. now we, we didn't attack every morning because some mornings uh, like a company will be in reserve and two companies will be on the line and they'll do the attacking and the one company will be in reserve just in case the Germans counterattacked the, the uh, driving forces. So, uh, the same way with regiments. If two regiments are on the line, there's one regiment in reserve, just in case the Germans counterattack. So uh, they, uh, sometimes we would be the platoon in reserve, and there would be two platoons that would go run, running down the, uh, uh, to the other hedgerow. And uh, that was a break for us. Sometimes we were the company in reserve. So, but but uh, when we heard that word jumping off in the morning, believe me, we were scared. And, and we'd, get, we'd get ready to go and we'd all try to hide 
the fact that we were scared. You know, we, we pretend that we weren't scared, but every one of us was scared to death to run across that field. Like some of the hedgerows were tall, some were short like this. So you just jump over the hedgerows, a little one, and you just start running. And of course, as you ran, whatever you had, if you had a, a rifle, you were firing the rifle from the hip. Because if you kept firing, hopefully the Germans would, would be afraid and they would be duck as low. They would, if we didn't fire, they'd be standing up and shooting us like ducks in a pond. So, so we ran as fast as we could and firing our guns. And, uh, and then here's the thing, too. As soon as we got to the, I don't know when exactly the Germans retreated, because we were attacking and they knew that we were going to take that hedgerow. They would retreat to the next hedgerow. And uh, the thing is, when we got to our hedgerow, we had to dig foxholes immediately. The Germans didn't have to dig foxholes. They got on the other side because they had slaves digging the foxholes. They had Italians. They had Slavs. They had Jews. They had, you know, they, they were slaves, and that was their job. They would dig the foxholes uh, Want to show the hedgerow? Could you go back and show the hedgerows? We would jump over this, over this hedgerow here, and we would run down the field, firing whatever weapons we had, and until we got here. And once we got here, we were rather safe because the big hedgerow was right in front of us, protecting us. And then we dig our foxholes in here. Now, when, when we uh, let's uh, let's say we attack, we, we attack down here. Right, right on the other side, the Germans were here firing at us. When they ran to the next hedgerow because they retreated, their holes would already be dug. The, the slaves yeah. dug the foxholes for them. Yeah. And uh, I didn't see too many Slavs, but we did uh, have one. There was this one Italian kid who was about 16 or 17 years old, and he was digging the holes, and uh, uh, somehow or other we got hold of him. And he was with us, and he told us what his, what his duty was. And uh, we told him, well, uh, you know, you can go home now. And he said, well, there's no, how do I get home? There's no way to get home. He said, I want to stay with you. And I said, you stay with us, you could get killed. He said, I have to take that chance. You know, I was trying to converse with him uh, in the little French that I knew and a little bit of French that he knew and a little of Italian that I knew and... Uh, so uh, I, uh, he finally convinced, he said he wanted to be with us. So I made him an ammunition carrier. He carried two boxes of ammunition. And that relieved one of my guys to carry uh, a rifle instead of a, a carbine. So he stayed with us oh, for uh, I, about a month, maybe a little longer. And, uh, and he, he risked his life every day as we uh, went over the hedgerows. And so he came right with us carrying the two boxes of ammo. And, uh, and then finally, after maybe five or six weeks, I don't know, I'm guessing, uh, we finally came to a town that had a railroad. And he said, okay, he says, now I can get home. And uh, he took off and went home, and we didn't see him anymore. He, lucky he survived. Yeah. Was it possible for tanks or armored kind of vehicles to go in front of you or with you to help? Oh, no, no. Too, too yeah, I'll tell you why. The tanks were useless here, mm -hmm. you see, because uh, if they attempted to come with us, you see, see they, if they tried to get over this, uh, remember, it was, say, about this high or this high, well, if the tank came up like this, it would expose the underbelly of the tank. And, and the Germans would fire, and bullets could go through the bottom of that tank, and certainly their 88s could easily go through and penetrate. So tanks were really useless in the hedgerows, and that was much to the chagrin of General Patton, because he wanted to get his tanks going. And uh, so that was a good question, thank you. Okay, so now, uh, again, the next, next day, we, the, the artillery, of our, our artillery would, would shell them quarter to nine, and at nine o'clock, bingo, jump off, and then we'd run down, uh, all the way down to the next hedgerow, and we kept doing that, kept pushing the Germans back farther and farther, but at a great cost of life, because you picture this. The Germans are behind a bunker like this, they, they, 
and they have their guns and they're firing away and the only thing we can see on them is their heads, really, and maybe their hands, but the rest of their body is you couldn't see. We were in the middle of the uh, field. They had our whole bodies for targets, so they were firing machine guns and rifles and, and mowing down a lot of men. We lost a tremendous number of men because you know, every time, every time we attacked, we'd lose some men. Some days we'd lose three or four or five, and in other days we'd lose two. But then we'd have to call in and say, well, what, what, what's your condition? We'd say, we need three, we need two, we need five, and we'd tell them how many men we needed. Let's see, we, we were in the hedgerows, I'd say, by June 6th, mm. and we were still in the hedgerows July 25th, we were still in the hedgerows, fighting every day. You know, as soon as we, the men got, took control of the beach, then they were in the hedgerow land, see? So the hedgerow land lasted quite a long time. We were in there a long time, only gaining about 100 yards or 75 yards a day, see? So it was very slow and very costly to move. And, uh, you know, I, I said, St. Lo, you know, there are only three dates that I really know where I was during World War II. June 6th, D-Day. I knew where I was. I was in England. That's where I was. Uh, June 6th. J July 25th, I was at St. Lo. Why do I remember St. Lo? Because when I was at St. Lo, I saw 2,000 planes come over St. Lo and drop their bombs. Now, I was up on a hill, sitting up on a hill, and uh, the, the planes were flying, there were 2,000 planes. I'm going to draw this for you. Okay. Now, we're still fighting through the hedgerows, and we're, this is now July. In fact, it's July 25th. And uh, let's see, June 6th, I knew in England. July 25th, I was at St. Lo. May 2nd, I was in near Czechoslovakia. Wow. Well, the reason I remember May 2nd is my birthday. So I, <laughs> I, I knew where I was on my birthday. But if you ask me where were you on May 4th or June 26th, I have no idea where I was. No idea at all. Okay, so this is Ju uh, July 25th, and here's Here's St. Lo. Now, uh, 2,000 planes were coming over like this. Here are the planes. Not, not very good looking planes, but these are airplanes going over St. Lo. And uh, here's, the, here's the thing that I couldn't understand. The, uh, the Germans had their uh, guns uh, firing up here. They had the 88s. You know, as I said, the 88 was the most versatile and the, and the deadliest weapons that the, uh, weapon that the Germans had. So they not only, the 88s not only knocked out tanks, they, knocked, they, they also were used for artillery. Now they use the 88s as any aircraft. So they would not, they were trying to knock down the planes. So here we have four, uh, 2,000 planes coming over St. Lo. And I was sitting up on a hill right here watching the planes. Now, the Germans were firing their 88s up here, and here the, the 88s were exploding, like, like here. And the planes would come like this, and they go right through. And, and I was saying to myself, why are they doing that? You know, they see, here's, oh, here. These are the German... Uh, ak -ak, the, the, the shells that are firing at the planes. And here the, the planes come along like this, and they go right through. Yeah. And I'm saying, why don't they go up above and, 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 and miss that? Right. So I didn't understand that until I, after the war, I came home and a friend of mine was in the uh, Air Corps, and I said, you know, why didn't they do that? You know, in the movies, you know, you see that, the, oh, ak at 40,000 feet, let's go up to 60. And they go up to 60,000 feet and get out of range. Well, he said, no, George, he said, once they're in a bombing run, you can't change your altitude. 
or you can, your direction. You just, it's, it's, you're locked in, and they're all flying, and they go right through, just like this, they go right through here and continue on dropping bombs. And uh, so you know, I learned that if, oh, here's another thing too. While I was up on that hill and these 2,000 planes came over, little pieces of, like, they were about this long, little pieces of sli silver paper. What do you think that was? Chaff. Radar jam. We're, we're on our way. The radar. radar. Chaff. What? Chaff. Chaff. So interrupt the, the radar. Yes, exactly. Yes. See, a radar beam is shot up, and, well, like, Right, like right, right now, they use a radar beam. They can fire a radar, radar beam at uh, Mars, and the, it, the, the beam goes out, it hits Mars, and it comes back, and they know the exact distance it is from Earth to Mars or from Earth to Saturn. But here, when, when uh, they were dropping these little silver things, they were trying to confuse the Germans who were firing at them. So it's, the, the little slivers would come down here, and the, when, when the uh, Germans shot their radar, instead of coming up and hit, hit the planes, they would hit these little pieces of silver paper that were thrown out. And they would, uh, make their, uh, they would set their bombs to explode here instead of here where the planes were. Yeah, so I, uh, I, I didn't know what they were at the time. And then, uh, and then uh, one, I don't know how I got that information. But anyway, I sent some of those little slivers because I didn't know initially what they were. I sent them home. And, and one of the email letters. So, now I'll tell you something else about St. Lo, too. You know, I told you that Don and I, 51 years after uh, D-Day, 51 years, 51 years after D-Day, Don and I went back to France. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you how, why, uh, how we met. Uh, there was uh, someone on television. Uh, talking about the Isle of Sieves. Now, I, a friend of mine was in the Navy, and he'd tell me his Navy stories, and I'd tell him my Army stories. And I told him about the Isle of Sieves. And he called me up. He says, George, he said, there's a guy on television talking about the Isle of Sieves. And I tuned in, and I got his name, and uh, I wrote to him. And he lived in France. And uh, I went, when I went to France... I met him there, and he took me, and I said to him, well, you know, I remember on the July 25th, I said, I sat up on this hill, and I watched the uh, 2,000 planes bombing St. Lowe. He said, no, George, they didn't bomb St. Lowe. I said, what do you mean? I said, I was, I was right on the hill, I saw it. He said, no, George, they weren't bombing St. Lowe. St. Lowe was here. Uh, let's, let's put St. Lowe here. St. Lowe was here. Okay. And right here is where they were bombing. And they were bombing there because we wanted to, to have a breakthrough. Patton was waiting. For, he wanted those thousands of planes to go over there and blast a hole in the German line. See, so the Germans had a very strong line here like this. And when, he, when the planes came over, they were bombing right here. And they blasted a big hole in here. So then his tanks would come along and go through that hole instead of going over the, uh, uh, the, uh, the hedgerows. Because now he had a big hole, no more hedgerows. And then right after he gets out of that hole, right here, there are no more hedgerows. All the hedgerows are gone. It's July, about July 27th. All the, all the hedgerows, and it's open country. So every, so every day, we, would, when we were walking like about 100 yards a day just to go from one hedgerow to the next, next uh, another 100 yards. When, when the breakthrough came, to, came, came through, the first day it came through, we walked four miles. We gained four miles in one day. I said, this is fantastic. The next day, we walked 12 miles. I said, I was so exhausted, I, you know, very digging the foxhole. I, was, I said, you know what, tomorrow I couldn't walk a half mile. I'm so tired. The next day, 24 miles. Yeah. I mean, it taught me something, really. That really, I, I learned something from that. 
I learned that when you think you're completely exhausted and you can do no more, you can do much more. This helped me a lot later on because like sometimes I'd, I'd be going to college and, and uh, maybe I, I fell a little behind in one of the subjects and I had to read, say, uh, uh, 300 pages. So I'd read 100 pages or 150 pages and I'd say, I'm too tired. You know, I can't. And then I'd think about what happened during the war and I would stay and I'd re complete that book. I'd read the entire book. It taught me endurance and perseverance. So, because I, I, as I say, I didn't think I could walk a half mile and, and we walked more than 20 miles. So, so we walked 20, here's the thing, we were following the tanks. The tanks were going so fast, we couldn't keep up with them. So what did they do? They got trucks and they put us on trucks because we couldn't keep up. Now if we're on trucks, then the trucks can go 50 miles an hour so we can keep up. We're gonna go back to the hedgerows again. And, uh, and every day we're, we're, uh, we're taking, uh, we're moving about 100 yards. And uh, you know, here's the thing too. We didn't, we didn't see any people. You know, once in a blue moon we'd see uh, a French civilian. I don't know what happens. I guess they know that uh, the Americans are attacking, and they know, so they move out of the area. They probably go live with neighbors or cousins far away from there, and then after we go through, then they come back to their homes. So we rarely, we rarely saw uh, uh, French men or women. But such, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes if we took a town, See, and the people would run, run out of the town. After the town was taken, they'd come back in, and sometimes it was another company that took it, and then we'd walk into the town, right up the main street, and uh, uh, in two columns, and then the French men would come out with a bottle of wine and, and give us a bottle of wine. We'd take a swig and pass it back and take a swig, and, and that, we'd all get a swig on, on the bottle of wine, and the women would come out and hug us and kiss us. They were so happy to see us. It was very emotional. So then we could, we, well, one time, uh, at one time, there was, there was a river there, and uh, we hadn't taken a bath maybe since, since we left England. Maybe we hadn't taken a bath in two months. So there was a river there, and we took our clothes off, and we got in the river. And I don't know, some miraculously, somebody came up with a bar of soap. A bar of soap was very hard to find. But somebody came up with a bar of soap, so we, we washed ourselves in, in the river. And, uh, of course, after we were washing ourselves in the river, some of the young French girls were on the other bank looking at us. <laughs> we didn't care. We didn't care at all. And uh, so we, at least we got our first bath, maybe in two months or three months. <laughs> Uh, sometimes we brushed our teeth maybe once a month, maybe twice a month. Uh, so we were really filthy. We wore the same underwear for two months or, or more. Uh, the, the pants that I had when I landed in Normandy in June was the same pair of pants that I had during the Battle of the Bulge. So that we went all the way through till December. Same pair of pants. So we, I mean, we, we, were, we were so filthy, it's, it's a wonder the, the French women could hug us. <laughs> we have bad breath and bad B.O. and uh, all kinds of bad things. All right, so anyway, we finally, uh, we got to this Isle of Sieves, and I want to tell you about the Isle. It was, it was an, a river island, and we had to take that river island. And... Uh, you know, when you're running through the hedgerows, at least you run from one hedgerow, you get to the next. But when you attack an, an island, and I could just imagine, I, never, I was never in the Pacific, I didn't fight in the Pacific, but I could imagine them coming from the water, going up on the beaches, that must have been hell. So uh, we were, we, we were gonna go, going to go up and attack Sieves. We attacked the first time, we were repulsed. We attacked the second time, we were repulsed. Three times we attacked, three times we were, we were repulsed. Well, because we were in the lowland, they were up on the island high. They could see us, we couldn't see them. And they had crossfire with their machine guns, and we were trying to walk through the crossfire, 
and we were getting mowed down. So we did attack three times, and finally we quit. And uh, we were regrouping, deciding what to do. We were waiting for orders of what to do. And uh, uh, one of the, uh, the chaplains came along, and he said, we're going to walk on the island. He, he said, I want some volunteers. So he, I we said, what do you mean? He said, well, they're going to call a truce. A truce will be called, and uh, we're going to walk on the aisle because there are so many wounded men. They were crying for us to come and help them because they were wounded, bleeding, and they were begging for help. So uh, a truce was called, and this uh, priest said he put on he was going to put, he put on a robe. It was a white robe coming down like this with a red cross. And he was looking for volunteers. Well, the first time he came to, a, to us, and he said, we're going to go, I'm going to go up, up, going up on the island. And he said, I need some men to come with me. And we said, you're crazy. You know, you're going to get killed. We, we said, no, we wouldn't do that. And he went around, and he came back the second time and said, look, all those guys are crying. They're dying. So he talked us into it. So we did follow him. And we, I was watching him like a hawk. And he was in front of us, leading the way. And I was watching him. I said, I feel, I feel, he, sooner or later, a bullet's going to go right through his chest. And he kept walking and walking. And we were following and following and following. And we walked right up on the aisle. Nobody fired a shot. And when we, we picked up the wounded. The Germans came out of their foxholes and came and helped us pick up the American wounded, put them on stretchers, took them back. They were helpful. And we, there were some Germans that wondered we helped them with the Germans. But most of the Americans and the Germans came out and helped us carry the Americans. That was really amazing. Now, about 20 years about 20 years after, maybe 20 or 30 years after the war, there was a reunion, the 90th Infantry Reunion in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So I went to the reunion, and we were eating and drinking, and, and guess who was there? Who? The German soldiers who were on that island. Really? Yeah. They were there eating and drinking with us, and friendly as could be, and what, you know, what a difference, you know. Uh, but, you know, uh, see, in the German army, there were two kinds of soldiers. One was the Wehrmacht. They were human beings. And that's what these, these guys were. They were human beings. Now, there's another element in the German army, the SS, or sometimes they're called Waffen. We call them SS. They were animals. They were cruel, evil people. As they bad as the Japanese. What? As, as, bad as, as, the Japanese. as bad as the Japanese, yes. They were terrible. They, if, if you were captured by the Wehrmacht, you had a chance to survive to go to prison. If you were captured by the SS, you were slaughtered. You were, they would never uh, save you. So we had to contend with that. So uh, that was the Isle of uh, Sieves, and uh, let's see. Oh yeah, this is another thing. When we were back there, uh, uh, Donna and I, and he took it. And when I mentioned that uh, I was saw the planes going over St. Lowe, he said, "No," he said, "George," he said, "They were bombing this other area. They weren't bombing St. Lowe." I said, "Well, the next day I we I went down, you know, with my group and." Uh, and I saw all the buildings in St. Lowe were leveled. So I said, I saw them level. He says, yes, but they were leveled on D-Day. The planes came over because it was a communication center as well. So that place was leveled on D-Day. I thought they were leveled on July 25th. <laughs> See? So that was a mistake, you know, that, that, I, that I made. I misunderstood. I made another mistake. I'll tell you about another mistake that I made later on. Okay. Um, what do we have now? Oh, okay. Yeah, now, as, as we were marching along like this and we were pushing the Germans back and kept pushing them back and they kept retreating, you know, one thing that was a little inspiring about fighting and attacking because 
I was saying to myself, you know, every time I take a step forward and, and attack, every time I take a step, I'm freeing that land for the, I'm giving it back to the French, taking it away from the Germans. And get, so that was sort of inspiring, you know, gave me a little more energy because I realized that every time I took a step, that was another piece of land that the French were getting back. Yes, I want to tell you about Hitler's men. When we were advancing like that, we were just pushing the Germans back and pushing the Germans back. And Rommel and von Rundstedt and all the other generals, they realized that the war was hopeless, that we were advancing so fast and so far. And when Patton's tanks started to go, they said, you know, we can't win the war. So they went to Hitler and they said, well, let's surrender. You know, so if we surrender now, we can maybe negotiate a peace and, you know, and not an unconditional surrender. So uh, Hitler said no. no. He, he said no. Rommel wanted it. Rundstedt, von Stuffnagel wanted it. Uh, uh, run, all all the, the bright German generals knew that the war, they couldn't win the war, so they wanted Hitler to say, surrender. Right. But he refused. So they left the uh, meeting, and uh, the next meeting they had with Hitler, this stuff medical came in with a bomb and a suitcase. And Hitler was standing at his table like this, and he placed the bomb right underneath the table. And the bomb exploded. They were, you know, they wanted to kill Hitler, get him out of the way, and then uh, sue for peace. Well, the bomb went off, and it injured some men. In fact, it killed some of the men, but Hitler didn't get killed. He got wounded uh, on his legs. He su suffered some of the shrapnel, but uh, he survived that because the tabletop was a, a thick piece of granite, and and the shell and the uh, fragments from the bomb hit the table and didn't hit Hitler. So it saved him. And then what did Hitler do with all the men who were there because they, they were all in on the plot? He had all of them murdered, every single one of them, except Rommel. Yeah. He did not kill Rommel. He, Rommel was permitted to go back to his home, no more he wasn't involved in the war anymore. He was permitted to go back to his home. And then Hitler gave him the order that he's to take the cyanide, two cyanide pills, and commit suicide. And he said, Rommel said goodbye to his family. He knew that he had to take the, he, I think he told his son that he was going to do it. I don't know if he told his wife. But then he got in the car, he took the two cyanide pills, and he committed suicide. So Hitler lost Rommel, one of his best generals. Okay. okay. So anyway, uh, yeah, once, uh, once that bombing took place, there was a hole in the German line because, so, you know, 2,000 planes bombing one particular area. So the tanks started to go through that hole. And when it went through the hole, there were no more hedgerows. It was wide open planes. And that's what the plane, that's what the tanks need. So they start moving and uh, we were moving, instead of uh, gaining 100 yards in a day, we were now gaining like 25 miles, 40 miles, 60 miles. We were in trucks following the tanks. Okay, Donna? Patton, sure. Okay, this is Patton. And, and just to show you, you know, he was trying to inspire his troops to be brave and attack and kill Germans. I want you to remember that no bastard ever won a war by dying for his country. He won it by making the other poor dumb bastard die for his country. And then, all this stuff you've heard about America not wanting to fight, wanting to stay out of the war, is a lot of horse dung. Americans traditionally love to fight. All real Americans love the sting of battle. When you were kids, 
You all admired the champion marble shooter, the fastest runner, big league ball players, the toughest boxers. Americans love a winner and will not tolerate a loser. Americans play to win all the time. I wouldn't give a hoot in hell for a man who lost and laughed. That's why Americans have never lost and will never lose a war. Because the very thought of losing is hateful to Americans. Now, an army is a team. It lives, eats, sleeps, fights as a team. This individuality stuff is a bunch of crap. The bilious bastards who wrote that stuff about individuality for the Saturday Evening Post don't know anything more about real battle than they do about fornicating. Now, we have the finest food and equipment, the best spirit, and the best men in the world. You know, by God, I actually pity those poor bastards we're going up against. By God, I do. We're not just going to shoot the bastards. We're going to cut out their living guts and use them to grease the treads of our tanks. We're going to murder those lousy Hun bastards by the bushel. Now, some of you boys I know are wondering whether or not you'll chicken out under fire. Don't worry about it. I can assure you that you will all do your duty. The Nazis are the enemy. Wade into them. Spill their blood. Shoot them in the belly. When you put your hand into a bunch of goo that a moment before was your best friend's face, you'll know what to do. Now, there's another thing I want you to remember. I don't want to get any messages saying that we are holding our position. We're not holding anything. Let the Hun do that. We are advancing constantly, and we're not interested in holding on to anything except the enemy. We're going to hold on to him by the nose, and we're going to kick him in the ass. We're going to kick the hell out of him all the time, and we're going to go through him like crap through a goose. There's one thing that you men will be able to say when you get back home. And you may thank God for it. Thirty years from now, when you're sitting around your fireside with your grandson on your knee, and he asks you, what did you do in the great World War II? You won't have to say, well, I shoveled shit in Louisiana. All right, now you sons of bitches, you know how I feel. Yeah. Okay. That was typical of, of one of his speeches, really. That's why he spoke all the time. Yes. You know, I, I told you I was a school a teacher, and I taught American history, and then I moved... I was teaching American history. I got up into Europe and I was teaching them about World War II. And uh, it was, I had this one class that was really the most comical class I've ever had. So they say to me, Mr. Morel, you know, when, when you were in, in uh, France, tell us about the French girls. You know, oh, I said, oh, you think I was a big sissy playing with the French girls? I said, I'm there to fight. I don't want to look at the girls. <laughs> so later on, I, I told them more, more about the war. And then finally, I got to another part of the war. And they said, uh, Mr. Moreau, didn't you ever get to Paris? And I said, yeah, I did. I said, I got a three-day pass, and I went to Paris. You got a three-day pass? How old were you? I said, 
20 years old. 20 years old and you were single and you went to Paris for three days. Tell us what you did in Paris for three days. And I said, well, the first day I went to the museum and the second day I went to the art gallery and the third day I went to the library. So <laughs> that was the end of that. So, but not the end of the story because about four years after I taught this class, I received a postal card from Marseille, France. Dear Mr. This, this, he, dear, dear Mr. Morell, he said, I was on sea duty for the last two months, and I finally got to Marseille, France, and I got a seven-day pass, and he says, I went to Paris, and I was there for seven days, and I went to the same museums and, and <laughs> the libraries you went to when you were here. Yeah, this is a very amusing class that I had. Okay, so, all right, let's get back to the war now. Now, once, the, once we had the, uh, the breakthrough, see, let's see, right around, I say here, we had the breakthrough uh, where we went from the hedgerows to the open country. So now, Patton, here's Patton coming along here, this is open country, and now we're on trucks, and we're heading east, and... Uh, we, as we were in the trucks and we saw signs for Paris and it said like 200 kilometers to Paris and then we went a little farther, 150 miles, kilometers to Paris, 120, he says, we're going to Paris, we're going to, well, we're going to Paris, well, we were so happy. And then one of the guys says, hey, he said, I saw a sign that said 150 miles, the one before that said 125, I saw you just misread the sign. And then we went on. And what was happening, we, then we got 180 miles away from Paris and 200 kilometers away because, see, Paris was here and we were here. And we, as we go there, we thought we were getting closer to Paris. You know, it's even more like this, see? And, and then finally, when we're here, we're going away from Paris and we saw that, that we were going away. We, oh, well, we were disappointed. So, uh, we, so here's where we came. Now, now this, this was probably one of the most dangerous moves that you can encounter in war. And uh, um, here is Paris, and here is Patton's going in this direction. He's going east, and he's going, you know, he said, we don't, uh, don't tell me we're holding our position. He wanted to keep advancing constantly, keep attacking. Hey, well, he knew one word about war, attack, attack and attack. So here he is, he's moving along here, and we're going like 50 miles an hour, 60 miles, I don't know how fast the trucks were going, but we're going in this direction like this. We're heading east. Now what is happening here, there's a German army unit going west. So they're going west, and we're going east. Just, just the opposite, like this. It's very dangerous because if they, if we're going like this, if they swoop down, they can cut us off. But instead, we went up. Hmm. See, we went up like this, and when we started to go up here, we were told that now we're we're. Uh, we're not on trucks anymore here, we're on the ground, and we're attacking towns here. And we were told that when we get to this next town, I don't remember the name of it, when we get to the next town, we're going to meet Montgomery there with the British. So we got to the next town, and Montgomery wasn't there. So then they said, we're going we're gonna to see him at the next town. So we went up to the next town, and Montgomery wasn't there either. Then finally, we went up to the next town, and it was, I said, I understood that it was the town of Falaise. So we were in Falaise, and we still didn't see Montgomery. By the way, if I may go back for a minute, I should have said this uh, in the beginning. On D-Day, Montgomery was supposed to take Khan on the first day. Before uh, Montgomery took off, he said to... Uh, the other generals, he said, when I land on the beach there, I'll take Khan, and I'll be in Falaise 
in 17 days. Well, he didn't get there till August. So he, he was supposed to be there in June. But anyway, we, we didn't see him, and we, and we moved up here. And what happened was, see, when we moved up here, here was, here was this large German army, uh, 350,000 or 450,000 troops. We cut them off. See, once we did that, they had no more supplies coming in, no more ammunition, no more food, no more water. They were cut off, and they were trapped, and it was in that town of Falaise that I thought was Falaise. <laughs> Again, <laughs> another mistake. So, so anyway, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what happened. I, uh, I went... I went to an, a reunion, another 90th Infantry Div uh, Division reunion, and I said, yeah, I said, uh, you know, when we were in Falaise, and this one fellow said, George, he said, we were never in Falaise. I, I said, what do you mean? I said, I, I know we were in Falaise. He said, no. <laughs> you know what? Here's Falaise, and here's... Chambois. See, when, when we came up north like this, we came into this town that I thought was Falaise, but it was Chambois. And I didn't find out until long after the war that we were in Chambois. We were never in Falaise. By the way, Donna and I, uh, you know, 51 years later, went to Chambois. And uh, we stayed there, and uh, we had dinner there, and uh, one night, uh, uh, the, the hostess invited the mayor and some other people, and it was a dinner in my honor because I was coming back to see them. And uh, so Donna and I were always drinking the cheap wine. We'd go and buy $2 a bottle, and we always drank the cheap wine. But if we're going to the party, local, I said, sorry, local, local wine. Local. Okay. So... Uh, we're going to the uh, party, so I bought a, a very expensive bottle of wine. I don't know, 14 or $15 I paid for it. So when we went to there, uh, the mayor was there, and uh, they sang the Marseillais, and, we, and uh, uh, the mayor said, here's a toast to George, and I drank the wine. It was terrible. <laughs> you know, was, I liked a $2 a, a bottle. I got used to that one, and I, I, the other one was terrible. But anyway, yeah. Also, while we were uh, in uh, Chambois, oh, yes, I have to go back now to Falaise. We just got to Falaise now, and uh, we cut off all these Germans. And uh, the, uh, we were out in the fields, and uh, all these Germans really wanted to surrender because they had no water, they had no food, they were running low on everything. So... They wanted to surrender. But you know what? In wartime, it's very difficult to surrender. It's, you, you know, you think it's easy. It's very difficult to surrender. And the reason is, see, the Germans are in one area here, let's say. Say there are trees here. And we're here. And they know we're here. And we know that the Germans are in here. Okay, so they want, these Germans want to surrender. So the only way you can surrender is you have to expose yourself. You have to see, show them if you have a, a flag, a white flag, you can do that. And Americans never had anything white. Anything that we had was always olive drab. <laughs> Patton didn't want us ever to surrender, no matter what. So anyway, uh, so these Germans are here, and they would come over here an inch toward the uh, uh, trees here, and they would try to surrender. But they were, as soon as an American saw a German uniform, bang, 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 and they'd run back into the woods again. So they would come out again, and, and, and it, as they say, it's very difficult, because we'd see the German uniform, and we'd start firing. So finally, I was here one day, and... Uh, I want to say, like, like right out here, and I said, Handy hoch, Handy hoch, kommen Sie here. 
Handy Hoke means hands up and then come here. And four Germans came out and surrendered. And I, I, boy, I said, gee, I'm going to write home and tell them I captured four Germans. <laughs> the next day I went out to the same place and I said the same thing. Handy Hoke, come and see here. Eleven Germans came out. I said, well, I'm going to write and say I captured 11 Germans. I went out the next day, the third day, three days in a row. Handy Hoek, come and see here. 10, 20, 30, 50. They just kept coming and coming down. And, and I had a, a carbine at the time. I, I, used, I always have a, I had a car. All I had was a little carbine. And they were coming out. And they had all kinds of swords. Now, I don't know what they were doing with swords, but as, as it came out, I'd say, well, drop, you know, put your uh, uh, weapons here, whatever weapons, and I let them know, and they just dropped all the weapons. And I had a pile up high like this, guns and, uh, and uh, uh, rifles and uh, P-38s and Lugers and uh, swords and all kinds of uh, things, and... They, they kept pouring out. Pouring, there were hundreds of them that were coming out and surrendering. So when I wrote home, I, you know, I said, I never wrote. If I wrote home and said I captured 100 or 200 Germans, who was going to believe that? So I never said a word about that. So anyway, but we did capture uh, many thousands of Germans that way. And uh, so now, one day, by, by the way, when we went north, we went north. Remember, we were going east, then we went north. When we went north, we came back into the hedgerows again. Oh. So we didn't like that one bit. So anyway, we were up in the hedgerows, and, uh, and one day, where I'm standing there in the hedgerows, and we heard a tank coming. I said, well, you know, it's an American tank. Now, American tanks had a cannon, but no flash hider. Germans had a cannon, always had a flash hider, see? So I'm standing there, and then I look at this low hedgerow, and I see, I hear the tank, and then I see the flash hider. And I said, it's a German tank. They're attacking us. And I, I'm looking for somewhere to run to get cover. And then the tank kept coming forward, and finally the hatch opens, and this man sticks his head out of the hatch, and he, guess what? He was Pole. He was a Pole. The, he was a Pole driving uh, a British tank. And there were, there were other Poles uh, driving tanks behind them. And he was waving to us, and, and then we waved to him, Polsky, saying, Polsky. And uh, so we were delighted to see him. And so we saw the, the uh, first uh, British part of uh, Montgomery's Armory, we saw the Poles win the tanks. The next day, we saw, we met the Canadians. They came in. And finally, the third day, Montgomery and the British came. And when they, you know, we were dirty and ugly. And, and we, when we looked at the, the English, they were so neat and orderly. <laughs> neat. You look like they were just coming out of the barber shop, really. They looked so neat. And we were, we were filthy, dirty, and scummy, really. And... Uh, so we didn't care too much for that. But anyway, uh, that, that was the fillets gap. Now, this is my personal opinion. You won't read this in the books, but this is what I... We call this the fillets gap. And we call it the gap, too, because this is where we, we, trapped, uh, we trapped the uh, Germans in here. But there was a, a little bit of a gap. See, we stopped in Chambois. I thought we were in Falais, but we were in Chambois. But the Germans that were in here, some of them, they were attempting to escape. They wanted to get back to Germany. So they were going through this little gap. And I could see them going through the gap. And I'm saying, well, why don't we close the gap? And I, 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 didn't, I couldn't understand that. Why didn't we do that? My personal opinion only. This you won't, I think... Patton was so angry because he was supposed to meet uh, Montgomery here. He was supposed to meet him here. He was supposed to meet him here. And I think he said, damn it, I'm not going to move until he comes to meet us. And that, that's my personal opinion. 
Uh, you won't read that in the books. But anyway, they were, I saw them escaping through that gap. And uh, then uh, what happened about a, a couple of days later, we were up along one of the hedgerows. And uh, remember when I showed you the hedgerows, I, I showed you the roads, and I said, try to remember this road? Okay, now think about that road. It was narrow, hedgerows on both sides. Now, uh, the hedgerows that you saw were too tall, but the hedgerows that we were behind were only about chest high. So we put machine guns up on there, and what happened was we saw two tanks, two German tanks, light tanks, coming up the road, this little narrow road between the hedgerows. And we were told, do not fire. We told all our men, don't fire. And we let the two tanks go through, and right behind them were trucks, and the trucks were going through, and they kept going and kept going. And I, we couldn't understand why we couldn't shoot, because there were Germans in there. And uh, they kept going, and then we found out, because we learned later, the two tanks went up this narrow road, and then one of our bazooka men, yeah. Johnny, well, we never knew last name. Bazooka. Johnny, Johnny Bazooka, okay. She'll call him Johnny Bazooka. But he had a bazooka, and he knocked out the first tank. It was a light tank. He knocked it out with his bazooka. And the German in the second tank had a machine gun and fired at him, and the bullet went right through his jaw, knocked out his teeth, blood come out of his mouth. He went back and got another round, going, came up and knocked the second tank out with his second round. He received the Congressional Medal. He deserved it. So, so here we are. The two tanks are stopped, and all the trucks are behind them. They have no place to go. And we were riddling them with machine guns and rifles and carbon. They were just we were shooting thousands of rounds into these. We didn't know what was in the trucks, but we, we knew there was something in there that they were trying to get away. So we kept riddling these trucks with the thousands and thousands of rounds of ammunition. And uh, then uh, the next day, this is the next day, right after, we, right after this happened, it rained. So we stayed where we were. But the, next, the second day, the sun came out. And we said, let's go down and see what, you know, what's on that road. And we went on that road, and we saw hundreds of dead Germans. Some were in the trucks, some were on the road, and uh, all, all just littered with Germans all over the place, hundreds and hundreds of them. And, uh, you know, some of the guys were looking for souvenirs. They looked for, looked for P-38s or Lugers. And some of them even wanted to take the, the Nazi rings and cut their fingers off to get the Nazi uh, uh, rings, the SS rings. So they were looking for, uh, uh, and it turned out to be sunny, and then you could feel, smell the stench of the dead bodies. And uh, so then, 51 years later, when we went back to Chambois, I said to uh, the host, I said, you know, I'd like to go, I, I know we're in Chambois, and I said, I'd like to go to this road where we captured all, you know, shot all these Germans and killed them all in that road. So he said, well, when the mayor comes, he may know. So the mayor, the mayor recommended someone, and that someone came to my house the next day and took me to see this road. And he took me in his car, and he said, uh, this is the road, and I looked and I said, no, this is not the road, because it was very wide. I said, you know, it can't be, this can't be the road, because two vehicles, two, two trucks could go through. It was a narrow road. So he took me to another place. And now I said, this isn't it. So I gave up. I told my host, he told the mayor, and the mayor said, I know someone who will take you to, he'll know. And I went with this man the, the second day, and he took me, and the first place we went to, I said, no, this isn't it. And then he took me to the second place, and it was a very narrow road. And I saw the hedgerow where we were standing behind, and I said, this is the road. And you know, there was a sign at the beginning of the road. It said, Colari della Morte. 
it means corridor of death. That was the name. And he, I said, well, you know, why did you put the sign? He said, because there were hundreds and hundreds of dead Germans in this one road. So we called it the corridor of death. Wow. Yeah, so that was, that was 51 years later. And that's it for today. <laughs> hey, that's, okay, we'll stop here.